Have you ever felt as if you're putting your money into a black hole when you give your weekly mission offerings? Maybe you should think about it more as dumping your offerings into the river, not to get rid of them, but to help mission flourish around the world. Mission offerings don't seem to get as much attention anymore, yet they're still vitally important to supporting work around the world. Think of your mission offerings as a river flowing through the entire world, providing life-giving water to help sustain the mission fields. You probably know countries and projects that are supported by part of your 13th Sabbath offering. But what about the regular mission offerings you give each week? Where do they go? What do they support? And what do they achieve? You may be surprised to learn that your weekly mission offerings help support the work of about 400 missionary families around the world. In fact, 70% of the weekly mission offerings each quarter helps to support overseas missionaries and the international work of the church. Appropriations from the General Conference to World Divisions, the Middle East North Africa Union Mission, and the Israel Field help these regions build and sustain mission activities in their territories like water irrigating fields when there's not enough rain. The remaining money helps various institutions and agencies that serve the World Church. For example, it helps the compassionate medical mission work of Loma Linda University, the outreach of Adventist World Radio, and the humanitarian ministry of ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. In recent years, millions of people from challenging areas of the world have found salvation in Jesus and have joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 2018, every 22 seconds, someone became an Adventist. And every four hours, a new church was organized. Thanks to your offerings and the global mission focus, thousands of new congregations have been established in unreached areas and among new people groups. But after these new believers have been baptized, how are they nurtured? How do we make sure that their new faith is strengthened and they grow as disciples? Your river of mission offerings helps grow and sustain new work throughout the world. Please keep this life-giving river flowing. Thank you for your faithful weekly mission offerings and your continuing prayers for Adventist Mission. The United States is the greatest nation that has ever existed in the history of the world, but the rise of the Republic was no accident. It was formed out of hundreds of specific events that started over 3,000 years before the creation of our Constitution. With such calculated history, could the birth of this nation be just coincidence? Or did the hand of God direct the formation of the new world? Explore the annals of history and discover the tapestry of events woven together to construct a brand new empire. Uncover the true reason Columbus set sail into uncharted waters. How the fall of Constantinople set the stage for the creation of our nation hundreds of years before its inception. See the Bible's warnings for our nation today. As we follow the events that shaped America, you'll see the evidence that we are a country founded on the principles of religious liberty and hear what we need to do to maintain our freedoms today. Final Empire. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each one of you. We're so thankful that that rain fell heavy last night, not this morning. Because I said a lot of rain fell last night. So it's good to see so many of you here this morning. Praising the Lord. Um, we are here again to learn more about the Lord. You know, get closer to each and every one. Lord, get closer to Jesus. And be happy and joyful today. Because I know sometimes, you know, we all work during the week. 
Some people might like the job, some people might not. But when you come here, you love what's going on here. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, Sister Nicholas, want to say a special thanks to those who supported 10 days of prayer. You know, some people attended all, attended all 10 days, some people attended just one day. And she said, want to appreciate that you all came out. And, it, and she said it was a success. All right. Um, 50 plus club today is having their, their luncheon today. it will be in a fellowship hall. So any more information, you can see Sister Chidi about that. So I know all the 50 plus persons are invited, that's what she said. Sister Chidi, right? Yes. All right, great. You want to come on, come on up and give, um, elaborate a little more on some of these other information here, please? Hi, good morning. How are you? Good, oh, good to see you guys on this rainy day. It's fantastic. I hope you had a good week. Bear with me. I'm going to go through a few announcements. And just fair warning, you will see my face here every week for the next five weeks. It will grow on you. So, we have a lot of things planned. I am the Family Life Director. Hey, thank you. Amen. Your faith in me is appreciated. Give it a minute. <laughs> Let's see if I live up to it. <laughs> anyway, but with God's help and your encouragement, we hope to turn, we hope to be a family in the true sense of the world. Wherever we come from, whoever we are, we are all family here and in the eyes of God. So I have a few announcements, so bear with me. First thing, anyone celebrating their birthday this month, please get up, stand up. If you had a birthday this month or are going to have a birthday this month, because it hasn't ended, stand up, please. All right, and we are going to sing for you. Happy birthday. Okay, I'm sorry. So, you know. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. All right. Amen. Because, see, I do not get to. If you don't tell me where your birthday is, it doesn't show up on the bulletin. But I don't want to miss you. I want you to feel special. You were born. It is a good thing you were born. You are blessed of the Lord. Amen. Anyone celebrating an anniversary this month? No? All right. You just missed the whole happy anniversary song. But that's okay. All right. That's the sec first thing. Second thing. We have a lost and found uh, box underneath the visitor's section there, out there, and it is filling up pretty serious. So, we are purging, at least I will be purging tomorrow. If you do not claim anything that's in that pile today, it will be gone by tomorrow, because it's been there for quite a while. And going forward, if you lose anything, we are going to be, anything that's not claimed in 30 days, we will give to Goodwill. Chances are they need it more than you, because you didn't claim it. <laughs> but the point is, we need to keep that place clean and looking neat and orderly. So please claim whatever there's lost that you are missing. In 30 days or at the end of the month, we will give away to Goodwill if it's not claimed. All right. And now my favorite announcement for today. The Family Feud Bible Game. We have a Family Feud Bible Game that we're putting on. Does anyone know what Family Feud is? Is anyone familiar with it? Do you like it? Yeah? No? Okay, somebody doesn't like it. I like it. I think it's fun. But for the people that don't like it, we have a little twist going on. It's based on the Bible. Yeah? Do you like that part? Amen. See, I'm doing okay here. So, the Family Feud game is a way for family to bond. That's what we do here at the Family Life Ministry, right? It is a fun family night for you to come out and spend time with your family in a fun, clean living style. You need something to do. There are things to do. There, you, know, you can spend your money all kinds of places. You can go to a movie. You can go to a concert. You can go to all kinds of things. But here's a chance for you to exercise those Bible muscles or just encourage those who, who dare to. 
right? And it's another way for you to support the Family Life Ministry. I could all ask you to just donate funds, and that's easy to do, right? To a point. I'm not trying to discount difficult money, financial difficulties of anyone, but I could just ask you to donate money. But I want us to have fun as family together on an evening, you know, where we could just do something. So this is the website. If you want to enter the competition, it's 11, right? 11.29, Robert? It's $10 plus $1.29 processing fee. Because again, this is a fundraiser. It's a fundraiser to raise funds for the Family Life Ministry. We're going to do a whole bunch of things this year, and we need the money. So enter the competition to flex your Bible muscle. You know, compete with your family members. Get them to see how good you are in the Bible. You know, how good are you? And how quick are those reflexes? And come out to support with an uh, attendance fee, if you don't want to enter the competition, it's also the same price, $10, $11.29, $10 um, $1.29 processing fee. And for the children, it's $5 plus processing fee, which comes to $6.15. That is the website. It is in your bulletin. Sign up. Encourage your friends, family to come out that day. We need the money. Come out and have a good time. Have a fun night. And it's not just the Bible feud game. Enoch, we'll be, we'll be working with Enoch to have some kind of mini music concert. We're going to have special music. You know, so if you like music, that's another good way. It is a good night. Please encourage it. We, it will not be successful without you. For more details, go to the website. It's in your bulletin. Thank you. And then the last announcement is, of course, our 50s plus lunch. Yes. So we're having lunch today for only 50 and above. Yes. That's exactly why I said 50 and above. You're not 50, so don't come. But, <laughs> but there'll be a lunch next week, and you guys are welcome then, okay? So, oh, well, you know, I would like to have a BMW, but... We all can have what we want. So, there will be a 50s lunch. You're invited. It's after, immediately after church. I will be checking ID. <laughs> but we're going to have a good time. And for all those people that have been asking me, Chidi, you're not 50. Why are you doing this? You will only find out if you come to the lunch. Um, all deacons, remember there's a meeting after the after church this morning, so meet up here, Brother McGregor, Brother, or head deacon, right on the right hand side here. All deacons meeting after the divine service. Sister Darcia, Proctor. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. So many of you might remember back in December, we celebrated our fifth annual Christmas giving event. I can't even believe I'm saying fifth. It's been that long that we have been supporting the community um, in such a great way. This past December, we supported the Fuller House Shelter, which is a 20 men uh, shelter, bed shelter and um, it's ran by Lifestyles of Maryland. So it pleases me to share with you some of the footage from our experience. There's no greater fulfillment in life than to give whatever you have to other people. Amen. Amen. To be honest with you, we, we don't get paid. And everything well, that, that you have here today was donated by church members. Uh, Sister Daisy, every year she organizes an event like this uh, as a way to show uh, God's love to the community. And um, uh, she's been writing up projects for us, and, 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 uh, and this is part of that. And then hopefully, when you see us out on the street, you'll say, Hey, I remember you. You'll come talk to us, and we'll talk to you back. Uh, we, we, we won't look the other way and say, Who's that guy? You know, who's he? Don't talk to me. No, we're not going to... Amen. So I was...
would like to read a letter to the church from the Fuller House thanking us uh, for our support. It says, Dear Supporters, Everyday Lifestyles is faced with individuals in our community in dire need of sustaining services, food, shelter, medications, and clothing, to name a few. Each day we try to meet those needs with limited resources. Your generous donation of dinner, gifts, and music at the Fuller House during the Christmas holidays was very much appreciated. Please be assured we do our utmost to be good stewards. We thank you for being a part of serving our community. And this is addressed to us here at the church. And so for those of you uh, who um, donated and need a tax um, write-off for those purposes, uh, this letter will be given to uh, Steve Enzweiler. And so you can um, obtain the tax ID for those purposes. Um, but I just want to ask everybody who donated to please stand at this time. We have a little certificate of appreciation for you. Um, so if you donated backpacks, food, supplies, whatever the case may be, please uh, stand and be recognized. Um, I do have a few special thank you. Come on, don't be shy. Stand up. Even uh, the parents of the adventurers. The adventurers played an intricate role in this. They made... Um, they made uh, uh, Christmas cards for the homeless, and it was just so awesome to see that. And so, Adventure Parents, you should also stand for your certificate. Um, I want to identify a few special people because without them, this would not be possible. These people not only, um, you know, donated food, but they also gave of their time to come to the shelter and help us out. Uh, so I'm identifying just a few people by name. Please, if I don't call your name, don't charge it to my heart. Uh, just charge it to my head. Um, so Pastor Dan, Vicki Nelson Flores, Chuck and Maxine Marsh, Deandra Thompson, Cheryl Williams. And as I call your names, please stand uh, uh, to get your certificates. Enoki Philho, Dwight and Irma Bias, John and Ruby Cooper, Pamela Rumpf, Roxanne Sanderson, Star Brianna Wells, and Antoine Proctor. So hopefully we didn't miss anybody, and if we did, just see us afterwards so you can obtain your certificate. Thank you again, and I just want to acknowledge um, the committee leaders. Uh, every single year, they answer the call, and without them, I could not be able to do this. Uh, so Karen Graham, uh, Sabine Doristal, and Samantha Doristal, I love you guys so much, and thank you for supporting me in this effort. Amen. I want you all to remember, date February 16th from 12.30 to 5 p.m. There will be a women's ministry, ministry special event. Um, we have different speakers, going to give um, guest speakers. We're going to give um, a talk on different sickness, illness, like cancer, for, you know, for us to see and what they have done. And we wanted you to all to come out and support them. And any more information, see Sister Maxine Marsh. She's in the back there. She can wave her hands. She's the leader of the women's ministry department. All right. Um, I think that's all the um, announcement this morning. Any first-time visitors, please stand. Any first-time visitors, could you please stand? I, know I see a few here. Many, many, men. Got one there. Brother, where are you from, sir? What's your name? Jordan? Okay, hi, Mr. Jordan. Welcome. And sis in the back there, lady in red, Where you? give us your name. It's a brother. Nice to have you all. Welcome, welcome. Members, we can't do it without you because without you, the church door will be closed. So we want you all to stand, greet each other, and make sure you greet each other to those visitors as well. Amen.
Hello, everybody. Hello. hello. Hello, yes. Happy Sabbath. I was gone for two weeks and I'm happy to be back. Amen. Happy to have you back. Amen. Thank you. Miss you guys. I'm glad to be here and worship the Lord with, with the church. Praise God. Yes, yes, yes. As we saw earlier today uh, on the, that video, we studied last Thursday a very interesting series of studies, amen, the final empire, right? And uh, it's fascinating to see how things have developed and how things are developing, to see where we are, right? And how close we are to see God establishing his kingdom forever and ever, amen? amen. It's very interesting. We'll see more uh, a little later today and uh, tonight as well. And we are here to tell everybody that there is salvation available. Amen? Amen? To all those who surrender their lives, there is salvation. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Let's sing together, church. I, I really want to hear you singing. Amen? Days of Elijah. We're going to declare the word of the Lord. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word
church. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. salvation so freely and who come to take us home hopefully very soon amen to worship you. May all of our praise, all of our thoughts, and all of our hearts be especially in tune to you. May we, may we remember your great saving activity and your creating activity on this very special day of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Good morning. The title of the story is In and Out of Prison. Have you ever known someone who was in trouble? How could you help them? Peter's friends prayed and prayed and prayed for him, and something amazing happened. Wicked King Herod rubbed his hands together and made plans. He would do away with the people who believed in Jesus. He would take care of that preacher, Peter. Guards, Pe King Herod shouted, guards, Peter went quietly with the soldiers who came to arrest him. When they arrived at the prison, Peter was chained to two soldiers on each side of him. The chains pinched Peter's arms, but Peter did not complain. He sat down on the cold stone floor and leaned against the wall. He closed his eyes and went to sleep. The news about Peter's arrest spread quickly through the city. Many of the believers hurried to John and Mark's mother's house. They... They often went to pray together, so it seemed like the right place to pray for Peter. They, the believers prayed and prayed and prayed late into the night. Back in prison, a bright light suddenly shone in Peter's cell. An angel tapped Peter on the, sh on the sh shoulder. Quick, get up, the angel said. The chain fell off Peter's wrist. Put on your sandals. Put on your coat. Follow me. Peter did as he was told. He felt as if he were dreaming. Peter and the angel passed between two groups of soldiers and came to the iron gate that led into the street. The gate opened by itself, and Peter and the angel walked out of prison together. The angel disappeared. Peter closed his eyes and opened them again. He really was on the street. It's true, he whispered to himself. The Lord sent an angel to help me. Peter hurried to John Mark's mother's house and knocked on the door. Rhoda, a servant girl, came. She heard his voice, but instead of opening the door, she ran right back into the house. Peter is at the door, she shouted. Peter's friends looked at Rhoda. That's crazy, they said. It's not possible. It's true. It's true, Rhoda insisted. Peter began knocking again when the people finally opened the door. They were astonished. <coughs> Someone grabbed Peter and quickly pulled him into the house. They listened eagerly as Peter told how the Lord had sent an angel to lead him out of prison. The believers laughed and cried with joy. And... Then they prayed some more. They praised the Lord for hearing and answering their prayers. The message of the story is, in God's family, we pray for one another. Amen. Who would like to pray? Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. I hope everyone has a good day at church, and I hope everyone... Who has, who is sick and can't come to church, come to church next Saturday. And they always come to church in God's heart. We thank you that we have, we're going to have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is the part of our service where we have an opportunity to pray. And uh, I encourage the folks who would like to kneel, please kneel. And uh, the rest of us will just bow where we are. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, I want to take this opportunity to lift up this congregation to you at your altar of sacrifice, the cross. We love you, Lord, and we want you to be honored by what we do and what we think and what we say. We humbly come before you, admitting that without you in our lives, our lives are uh, out of control and impossible to balance. We know that only you are the one who can restore us to sanity. And we dedicate everything we have to you. Our souls, our resources, our lives, our wills, everything to you. Lord, we want to take this opportunity to thank you for the gift of a Sabbath, a time that we can commune with you, to spend time with our families, and to get rested. I also want to thank you for the gift of marriage, an institution that you initiated during uh, Creation Week. It's an institution within which we can minister to each other with your blessing. I also want to thank you for the gift of Christ's sacrifice on the cross because without that sacrifice, there would be no hope for life after this earth. We humbly ask that you will accept our petition to reach down and minister to everyone on planet earth. Lord, you know who we are. You know what our needs are. You are the only one who can heal us. We pray that you will touch us with your healing hand. You are the only one who can forgive us. We ask that you will forgive all of our sins and let us start over with a clean slate from this moment forward. Lord, we pray that you will give us hearts of patience and love and tolerance in place of our hearts of stone. We pray that you will grant us the wisdom to make the right decisions. Help us to have a clear mind so that we can hear you and give us the strength and the courage to act on what you tell us. And Lord, we also want to ask that you will intervene in our lives with those people who have control over our lives. And this morning, I particularly want to lift up our politicians. Lord, they need your guidance. And we ask that you will impress on each one of them to make the, the right decisions. And finally, Lord, we pray that you will uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Happy Sabbath once again, church. Our Bible reading is taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. I'll read from King James Version. It says, And the ten ones out of this kingdom are ten kings, that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be divers from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his end, unto a time and times, and the dividing of time. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. I'm very happy to have Sister Harry singing for us again today. She brought her friend one more time. Thank you for coming. Whenever I invite her, she graciously accepts and she finds uh, uh, some space in her schedule to come. Uh, may God bless you. I know the church will be blessed. And thanks again for coming.
Happy Sabbath. Um, we're going to do a Christmas song. Um, I feel that uh, today would be the last day we can do a Christmas song for this year. Uh, it's called We Are uh, We Are the Reason. And of course, the message is relevant for the whole year. We are the reason that um, he was born a babe, Jesus, and he gave his life for us so that we can live forever. As little children, we would dream of Christmas morn and all the gifts and toys we knew we'd find but we never realize a baby born one blessed night gave us the greatest gift of our lives we are the reason that he Suffered and died to a world that 
It's the 20th of January, 1649, and it's a trial unlike any other in the history of England. Charles I is being tried for treason, and Oliver Cromwell and his men have handpicked 68 judges. Now, the king is defiant. He refuses to believe that a monarch can actually be tried by his subjects, and he demands to know by what authority they're doing this. Charles believes, you see, in the divine right of kings, a long-standing idea that kings receive their authority directly from God. To Charles' way of thinking, a rebellion against the crown, well, that's a rebellion against heaven itself. To suggest that a king might be guilty of treason seems ludicrous to him because while well, the very definition of treason is to betray the nation, and the king is the embodiment of the nation. So whatever Charles wants, well, that's ordained by God. So he insists that he will only answer to the charge of treason if the court can prove they have the right to try him. And at one point, he reaches out and pokes a court official with his cane, and the top of the cane falls off. Now, never in his life has Charles ever had to pick something off the floor because, well, that's what servants are for. But on this day, nobody moves. And that's when Charles realizes he is no longer a king, but a mere man. And the object resting on the floor is a dark omen of what's going to happen next. On the 25th of January, Charles is convicted and sentenced to death by beheading. was executed right here, outside the banqueting house in Westminster. Now, there was nothing special about the executioner. The people who were here tell us his head came off with a single blow, which means that the sentence was carried out by an executioner who had performed an awful lot of them on mere commoners. The severed head was hoisted high above the crowd, the executioner shouting, behold, the head of a traitor. Now, it's not the kind of story most people would read their kids at bedtime, but it is one of the most important moments in European history. Another one of the threads we have to pick up if we're going to understand how America was born. At that moment, when the common people tried and executed a king, a new idea was taking root very quickly. The universal rule of law, where even a monarch had to obey, was, of course, kind of a violent way to make a point, and Cromwell did make a lot of mistakes after that, including, well, just dismissing Parliament when he didn't like their opinion. But the point had been made. The tide was turning in Europe, and people were starting to question absolutely everything, including a thousand years of social organization. And the most thoughtful, the most influential of these people started to move away from swords and spears, and instead, they adopted the power of the pen. The Church of England, of course, was founded on a sticky personal problem that Henry VIII had. He wanted an heir, and his wife was barren. So he wanted an annulment. The Pope wouldn't give him one. Then he noticed that a lot of the German princes were shaking off the authority of the Pope, and he thought, you know what, I could do that too. I could become the head of a new independent church. Now, when England formally broke with Rome, the hopes of a lot of people probably started running high because, hey, maybe like some of the people over on the continent, they could finally be free to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. Maybe they could be free to answer directly to God and not through a state-prescribed religion. That's not at all what happened. By the 1600s, people began to realize that they had exchanged one form of religious tyranny for another. The new Church of England was not just one more religious option, it became compulsory. By 1593, there was a law known as the Conventicle Act forbidding any religious gathering of more than five people outside of an officially sanctioned parish church. So essentially, a home church could land you in jail. After the English monarchy was restored in 1660, they passed another law, the Act of Uniformity, which said that all clergy had to be ordained by the Anglican bishop, and all church services had to be conducted according to the Book of Common Prayer. There was no room for creativity and no room 
for differences of opinion. So the 1600s proved to be anything but a time of religious liberty. In fact, in some ways, things might have even gotten worse. You had all these groups popping up, people known as nonconformists, and they're just the people who want to worship God the way their own conscience told them to. People like the Barrowists, who believed you didn't need the sanction of the state to worship God however you wanted. People like the Fifth Monarchists, who had studied the four kingdoms of Daniel and decided the next world empire was going to be the kingdom of Christ. And people like the Levelers and the Puritans and the Quakers and the Sabbath Keepers, none of them were allowed to worship freely. Most people have heard of John Bunyan, the man who wrote that great classic, Pilgrim's Progress. What some people don't realize is that he wrote it while sitting in prison for his faith. In 1661, he was convicted of breaking the Conventicle Act, which forbid worshiping or preaching in private. So what they did with Bunyan is said, look, if you agree to stop preaching, you'll just spend three months in prison. Otherwise, you're going to have to stay here. Bunyan chose to stay. His faith was that important to him. He was in the Bedford County Jail for 12 years. So when a lot of people realized that they were never going to be free, some of them took up arms to change the country, like Oliver Cromwell. But some of them decided to leave, and they came here to the Netherlands, which was the freest republic in Western Europe at the time. Here, people with different religious opinions somehow managed to live side by side without killing each other. They were experimenting with a novel concept, religious liberty, and it was working. The Dutch were really onto something, and they found themselves taking all sorts of religious refugees. During the 1600s, this was the place to be. The nonconformists, or dissenters as they were sometimes called, were coming here from England. The Huguenots were fleeing religious persecution in France. And maybe most importantly, the Jews were coming from Spain to get away from the wrath of the Inquisition. Now let's take a bird's eye view of this for a moment, because this is one of the most important moments in the birth of America. These dissenters coming from England were Protestant, and they believed that the best model for the Christian life was found not in canon law or in long-held tradition, but in the pages of the Bible. Most of the educated dissenters could read Latin because that was the current language of learning. But very few of them could read the Bible in the original languages. So here in the Netherlands, there was this entire Jewish community who could teach them. Suddenly, they were reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, and they had access to some very old commentaries. And in the midst of their studies, they stumbled into that story we looked at last time about Israel asking Samuel for a king. The dissenters' jaws were on the floor. Was it possible that this was the reason they were still having trouble with human kings to this day? And was it possible, if they had already thrown off the political shackles of a powerful bishop, that they could also dispense with having a king? This became one of the biggest debates of the 17th century. What could you do if you had a nation that didn't have a king? I mean, clearly, God had been angry when Israel asked for a monarch, and the world had been struggling under human empires ever since. So what if the dissenters reversed that decision? What if they created a new situation where people could be directly answerable to God the way they had been prior to the incident with Samuel? Now, I know this likely did not come up in your history classes in high school, but do not underestimate how important this was. Here were people who dreamed of a new republic that didn't have a king. To you and me, that just seems like old news. But in the 1600s, that was revolutionary. And I use the word revolutionary quite deliberately. The very ancient Israelites these people discovered lived in a republic instead of a monarchy. And when you go back and read their deliberations, you'll find some of them referring to the government of Israel as the Hebrew Republic. And then they dug even deeper, and they stumbled onto Deuteronomy 17, where God actually predicted that Israel was one day going to ask for a king. And in that event, 
If that's what they insisted on, God provided some very strict guidelines, a safety rail, if you will, to prevent things from getting out of control. Now, this is a passage that does bear reading at length because what we find here are some of the key concepts that gave birth to the American Republic. I'll start reading in verse 14. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. In other words, they were supposed to follow God's guidelines. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So the king had to be native born. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. In other words, the king would not be permitted to return his people to bondage, even if he thought it meant prosperity. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So there were checks and balances, if you will, in an effort to stem corruption. Now comes the most important part, verse 18. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So we had the absolute rule of law, a nation where the king had to live by the same laws as his subjects. Now, this passage sparked a great deal of controversy because it raised some important questions. Had God actually wanted a king for Israel? Or was a king just plan B in case everything went haywire? D did the existence of a king make God angry? Or was a king God's plan all along? One thing was clear. If we're going to have to live with human government, there are some forms of government that are much better than others. And this was one of those. So what we have in the 17th century is a broad group of diligent Bible scholars who become absolutely convinced that what the Israelites had in the very beginning was a republic. And these ideas that the top executive should be native born, that you had to prevent corruption and that everybody should live by the very same law, including the top executive. Well, oddly enough, those same ideas made their way into the American Constitution because the founders of the American Republic were students themselves and they had been reading the works of the English dissenters. They'd read John Locke, who'd been forced to hide in the Netherlands when he was accused of plotting to kill the king. Today, Locke is widely regarded as one of the architects of our liberty. And while hiding in the Netherlands, he wrote a letter concerning toleration, which made powerful arguments suggesting that the proper sphere of government was civil matters and the proper sphere of the church, spiritual matters. The only business of the church is the salvation of souls, and in no way concerns the commonwealth, or any member of it, that this or the other ceremony be there made use of. Neither the use nor the omission of any ceremonies in those religious assemblies does either advantage or prejudice the life, liberty, or estate of any man. The Founding Fathers had also read the works of John Milton, the famous poet, who argued for the rule of law and the consent of the governed. It follows lastly that since the king or magistrate holds his authority of the people, both originally and naturally for their good in the first place, and not his own, then may the people, as oft as they shall judge it for the best, either choose him or reject him, retain him or depose him, though no tyrant, merely by the liberty and right of freeborn men to be governed as seems best. These were powerful ideas, and today we find those same ideas in the American Constitution. It was an idea whose time had come.
some of these ideas also made their way on board the famous Mayflower a ship that carried Puritans to the New World. Puritans who had been hiding here in the city of Leiden in the Netherlands, like many others were. Today we call them the Pilgrims, a name that captures the essence of who they were, deeply religious people looking for something better from the hand of God. Here in the Netherlands, they found religious liberty, the freedom to worship. But over time, they became concerned that their children were growing up more Dutch than English. And because the Netherlands were an important center of world commerce at the time, they were also worried that their children might become rather worldly. So they decided to do what so many others have done ever since, get a new start in a brand new world. Now, what they intended to do was settle in a relatively established area near the mouth of the Hudson River. But the wind mysteriously blew them off course and they ended up here in Plymouth, an area that had already been somewhat developed by the Patuxet Indians. But the Patuxets had been wiped out by a devastating plague before they arrived, and the few remaining survivors had already left. So the pilgrims found an agreeable piece of land that had already been cleared. And more importantly, they found stores of corn that had been buried in the ground. And that was enough to help them survive their first brutal winter in the New World. It's really an incredible story. So incredible, in fact, that the pilgrims themselves became convinced, like Columbus, that God had sent them here. There were just too many coincidences to believe anything else. Take, for example, the story of Squanto. Now his real name was Tisquantum, but apparently they found that too hard to pronounce, so they shortened it to Squanto. It turns out that Squanto had been kidnapped, not once, but twice by Englishmen who had taken him captive to Europe. He was eventually liberated by some Spanish monks and made his way back to the New World, only to find out that his people had been wiped out by plague. It was a horrible series of events that was perpetrated by some really bad people. But like Joseph of the Bible, who was sold into slavery and ended up saving God's people, Squanto ended up saving the pilgrims. Not only did they discover a local resident who happened to speak English, but they also found a man who could teach them how to survive in their new home. From Squanto, they learned how to raise corn and mine the riches of the local rivers for food and they also negotiated peace with the Wampanoag tribe, a peace that lasted 50 years. Now, here's the interesting part of this story. Because of his time in Europe and because of his time with the Spanish monks who liberated him, Squanto had already been exposed to Christianity and he'd adopted some of it. But his ideas were Catholic and the pilgrims were rather staunch Protestants. In some parts of the old world, this might have been a problem, but the pilgrims had already been living in the Netherlands where religious toleration was popular. And now they were building a new existence in the new world where eventually the various sects of Christianity would be able to coexist peacefully. Not that the pilgrims always got it right because in the beginning, they were really only interested in religious liberty for themselves. Turns out that centuries old religious habits can be very hard to shake and we have some horrible examples of religious intolerance that took place in decidedly Puritan communities. As other Puritans joined these brave souls who'd come on the Mayflower, Plymouth was eventually overshadowed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a place they all hoped would become a shining example of good Puritan government. But in spite of the grief that they'd experienced in the old world, it was still a theocracy, a new state that still had an official religion. So when people with different opinions showed up, like the Quakers, there was trouble. At first, they simply banished these people from the colony. They even fined ship's captains who brought Quakers over from England. Eventually, things escalated, and they began confiscating property, cutting off ears, or boring holes in Quakers' tongues to keep them from speaking. 
Eventually, they even used the death penalty. The most famous case, of course, being that of Mary Dyer, who was hanged here on Boston Common in 1660 for the simple crime of coming to town. The previous year, they had already walked her up to the scaffold and put the noose around her neck as a warning. So, no, they really didn't get it perfect. But, for that matter, you and I don't always get it perfect either, because even though we now live in this free republic, we still sometimes struggle with the idea that people should actually be free to believe whatever they want, say whatever they want, to the point where now some points of view are being forcibly removed from the public arena. But still, in spite of our fallen humanity, here we are, with a constitution that guarantees a lot of things that you and I now take for granted. But back in the 17th century, when these ideas were first taking root, they were nothing but a dream. A dream that was cherished by people who had seen something better in the pages of the Bible. And some of those early settlers were much faster than others to put those new ideas into practice. Take Roger Williams, for example, a man who was expelled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and went on to found the colony of Rhode Island, where the separation of church and state became reality. And William Penn, the devoted Quaker who had been locked up in the Tower of London for his beliefs, but then went on to create the colony of Pennsylvania, where people were free to exercise their faith, including a very interesting settlement at Ephrata that decided they would keep the seventh-day Sabbath instead of Sunday. So it might have taken time, and we might have been slow to learn, but things moved much faster here than they did over in Europe. In fact, compared to the pace of the old world, which was still beleaguered by centuries old power struggles and hindered by complicated political considerations, these new ideas were taking root at an astonishing pace. As Victor Hugo once put it, there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And when you see all the things that had to happen to make this republic possible, well, you've got to wonder if somebody wasn't driving the process. Today, it's become popular to suggest that the reason we have religious freedom is because of the Enlightenment. The way some people tell the story, the world had been steeped in religious superstition for a very long time, and then the light of reason overthrew the superstition and finally set us free. Now, to be sure, the founders of the American Republic did consult with the ancient Greek philosophers, and they did tap into the Enlightenment, which was a good thing because they did manage to mine the very best ideas. But to suggest that America was born chiefly from secularism, that's just not true. The ideas that made this republic were born in the hearts of Christians, Christians who were open enough to study the classics, but still Christians. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Bunyan, Milton, and countless others drew their inspiration from the Bible, and then we drew our inspiration from them. What occurred in the United States happened because Christians finally recognized in the wake of the Reformation that something had gone horribly wrong when we married church and state. They recognized that Jesus had never suggested any such thing, and they set themselves to the task of undoing the damage we caused. In the words of Jesus, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. finally recognize that Jesus never sees the reins of power in order to make his point. We shouldn't be doing it either. The kingdom of God is built on love, not force. That's the very thing that we were trying to set straight here in America. 
Now, here's the thing that you've really got to wonder. If all of those other big empires, from Babylon to Rome and beyond, if they're all in Bible prophecy, what about the most powerful, wealthiest nation in the history of the world? Shouldn't we be able to find America in prophecy too? You might be surprised at what we find, and you might really be surprised at what the Bible says comes next. I can get a few deacons to help me out here. Um, if you're visiting today, we are on part three of a series called Final Empire, and we are taking a look at, at Bible prophecy, and we're, and we're partnering with uh, the Voice of, Voice of Prophecy as one of their uh, satellite places uh, called the Discovery Center. And throughout four times of the year, we have a very targeted uh, short-term uh, prophecy seminars. And this is the first one that we've uh, participated in. And there's just a 25-minute a, a video followed by um, uh, a usually seven, six or seven, eight question uh, Bible study that we follow up afterwards. So we've been looking at specifically how God has laid out plans and has showed us how what is taking place in society uh, is part of his plan to bring the universe back into the way he originally planned it to be. And, and today, uh, Pastor Sean Boonstra uh, especially highlighted uh, the idea of, of, of religious liberty. Uh, when, I, when I see you looking up this way, we'll, we'll go ahead and start the study. Uh, I'll know when to start. We're really glad that, that you're here today. I, I see uh, several friends from, from my past. Uh, Etha, good to see you. Uh, we, we met at camp meeting about 20 years ago. And uh, I, I remember her sister... Uh, Silva Lita, they, they had, came and had special music with their hands, uh, I think it was. I kept teasing them. I, I'd like to see you do that with your feet. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, of course, my mom's here. Uh, really great to see my mom and my brother, and also Harry and, and John and, and um, Mark. John, are you still single? Yeah, I, I think I, we talked about that last time, yeah. All right, does everyone have a sheet that wants one? We, we don't want anyone left behind? Because we'll, we'll follow very closely what's, what's on the sheet. Small, you need one? Go ahead, raise your hand high. Two, he, he wants two. Anybody else? Anyone else? All right. The earth... Uh, opens up and we'll try to make this as interactive as possible if you have a question feel free to raise your hand and ask if if uh, i know the answer uh, i'll tell you if i don't i'll be honest and tell you i, I don't know but i'll 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 try to find that answer either that or i'll i'll ask ernest and and he'll we'll know the answer after that just teasing you ernest yeah thanks the earth opens up uh, question number one when the first century religious authorities in Jerusalem were deciding how to handle the emergence of, the, of a new sect of believers in their midst, the first Christians, what was the sage advice given by the great scholar Gamaliel? Who's, who was his famous student? Do you remember? Paul, that's right. Paul was, was a student of Gamaliel. Uh, let's look here at Acts 5. 33 to 39. Say, Brother McGregor, you, you got a really good voice. Would you mind reading that? Acts 5, 33 to 39. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, 
a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. A number of men, about 400, joined him. I think, it, I think I, we missed something. Yeah, I think, I think we're out of order. This is the next season. No, okay, I'll just go on. Um, a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. Keep reading. After, okay. Uh, and now I, <laughs> all right. Um, after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. So sometimes you have to wait things out and, and see uh, if, if it brings unity, if it, it really builds on how God has led in the past. And sometimes it's not always the most prudent thing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against something, even though it might seem like the, the most expedient thing to do. Does that make sense? Now, uh, uh, Brother Wesley pointed out to me that some of you might have gotten lesson two by accident. So make sure, that, does anyone need lesson three? All right. Uh, any more lesson threes? Oh, yeah. And, and there's uh, also on the front row here. One of the one of the challenges of having a pastor with ADD is that he doesn't always get these details right. So I've been praying for the right detailed person to help me keep things in order. So thank you. Uh, number two. Uh, does anyone else need a number three? I feel like I'm at, at McDonald's ordering. Uh, anyone need number three? Okay. The, the fifth monarchists were a 17th century English group that believed there would be no more massive empires like Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome that were expressly predicted and permitted by God. Can you guess by their name what prophecy in the Bible might have inspired that belief? Daniel 2 verse 44, our scripture reading. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Any questions on this one? We're going to move right along here. 3A. God had foreseen his people's weakness and knew that they would eventually succumb to the temptation to self-govern and ask for a king. And we covered that quite in depth last night uh, here at um, the, the Final Empire Session 2. As is usual with God, he allowed them to have what they wanted. But at the same time, out of compassion and to preserve his people, he provided safeguards against outright tyranny. What were some of those safeguards? We'll keep, we'll keep reading on, but at the same time, 
Oh, what were some of those? Super, okay, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that this heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Any questions? 3B. Uh, what elements of the American Constitution and the original structure of the American Republic can you res see reflected in this passage? Go to the purpose. B being born in America? There you go. Very good. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Yes, Roxy. That's right. Everybody is 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 on the on the same playing field. Very good. I, I saw Karen. That's right. We we don't want you profiteering from from your position. What what else? Any others? Okay, we'll, we'll move along here. Uh, question four. All through the darkest years of a corrupted Western Christianity, there were voices suggesting that Bible prophecy had predicted a concentration of kingly power in the official structure of the church. During the Reformation period, these voices grew louder. Many identified the little horn of Daniel 7 as the little kingdom among the kingdoms of Europe that would be the source of the problem. What do horns represent in Bible prophecy? Anyone know? What do horns represent in Bible prophecy? Brother Enoch? Kingdoms, powers? Did, did you look at the slide ahead? Ahead? No. Uh, Daniel 7, verse 24. The, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. So you're right on. Very good. Very good. 4B. The little horn comes up among the kingdoms that arose in the former Roman Empire, but it is different from the others. What are some of the characteristics that set it apart? Any guesses? I know there are a lot of students of Bible prophecy here. Oh, I'm getting on overload here. We'll move on here. Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute 
the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Any questions? Okay. Number five. Because of the striking similarities between the animals of Daniel 7, which represent Gentile kingdoms, and the strange-looking beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13, Christians over the centuries have recognized that Revelation 13 is showing the cumulative end result of all those worldly kingdoms. The animal depicted in Revelation 13 proves to be describing the same thing as the little horn of Daniel 7. Both are the end product of long years of human kingdoms. What evidence do you see that these things are talking about the same thing? Any thoughts? Brian, do you have your hand raised or are you just stretching? Okay. Don't worry, we're almost done. Uh, I... Revelation 13, 1 through 3. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So what does this dragon represent? Any guesses? The devil. I heard did somebody say the devil. Who, you say that? Uh, I heard somebody. Satan. You guys, you guys must be uh, good Bible students here. Yeah, that's right. Revelation twelve nine identifies him. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He has. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, how about a woman in Bible prophecy? What does a woman in Bible prophecy represent? Church. Oh, man, everybody knew that one. Yeah. Uh, Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife was made herself, has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So a lot of good stuff to unpack there. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Husbands, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, and that she should be holy and without blemish. So you see, that the answers come when we compare Scripture with Scripture and the decoding of of Revelation, some of this apocalyptic literature uh, comes from uh, the Bible itself and helps us understand what is uh, being talked about. Number seven, the persecution would eventually get so bad that God would have to intervene. What does the Bible say would happen to alleviate the situation? But what's going to alleviate all this persecution that's going on? Revelation 12, verse, verse 16, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. It's not going to last forever. 
the, the, the trials and the tribulations that we face will come to an end. And God has made this very clear. Until then, we have the hope that we know what the end is going to be like. And we know that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our salvation is assured. That hope is what gives us the strength to live and to, to keep on living as the Bible has called us to live. I, I want to encourage you uh, to continue to be students of prophecy. And if you're available this evening, we're meeting for our, our last session tonight at, at 7.30. Uh, and we'll be following it up with uh, a, a very special series during the month of March. Uh, all throughout the month, starting on March 6th, Friday, all the way through April, uh, the first the Saturday in April, we'll be going in detail over some of these uh, Bible prophecies about, about four nights a week. And again, this is in partnership with, with, with Pastor Sean. Uh, I'd like to invite the deacons uh, to go ahead and, and uh, be ready for, for our offering. Again, I, I thank you for your, for your faithfulness. Uh, as was, was uh, noted in the bulletin, uh, you tend, the, the congregation continues to be very generous in returning faithful tithes and offerings. Uh, you can see that for the last year, 2019, uh, we had one of our, our most um, blessed years as far as total tithe. Go ahead and come, come forward at this time. Uh, $315,000 and $3,015 and $50 and 42 cents. Can we say praise the Lord? Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, none of that money stayed here at the local church. We, we support the Adventist Church as a worldwide uh, denomination, and the tithe goes to support the, the, um, the larger work of the church uh, as a whole, and uh, we continue to, to be blessed in meeting our monthly obligations, but please remember those. Our, our monthly goal is $15,167, and again, we, we thank you for your faithfulness. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to return to you uh, the, the blessings that you have given us financially, and as we return a portion to you, may it be blessed and be used wisely by those entrusted it, uh, so that it truly furthers your kingdom. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
let's all stand for the benediction, please. Let's go ahead and close our eyes. Oh, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for bringing us here another Sabbath. As we study thy word, as you said, study thy word, show thyself approved unto you, Lord. Lord, and we have that chance, Lord, as we all in our song, mind. Learn more about you, about what you have given us those different prophecies in the Bible, Daniel, different places, dear Lord. Help us to dwell in our hearts, help us to dwell in our minds. And Lord, help us to be ready. So when you come, we all will be going to heaven, Lord. We all, I want to see each and every one there as well. And not just you want to see us all there. Because as you said, you hope that no one will not depart, but you hope that everyone will be there. But let us all give our lives, ourselves to him, Lord. Bless us all as we go to our various homes this afternoon. Safely, Lord, take us there safely. And bring us back to the next Sabbath, or bring us back tonight as well, to learn more about you. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. you out. Robert, Robert.